Okay, well, we are continuing in our series in Genesis, at least for today and next Sunday. Uh, and then we should be done um, with the book of Genesis. So we're at the very end of Genesis, the second to the last chapter, Genesis chapter 49. And since we're now coming to the end of Genesis, and since there's been a break uh, many weeks since I haven't been preaching here, and we haven't been in Genesis, and you know, our memories are failing, at least mine is, and often it's good then to recall uh, what is the context we are in. For that sense, I want to give a brief overview of certain aspects of the book of Genesis to refresh our thoughts, remind us. But not only that we might be forgetful and not only that we've had a break from this series for the summer, but because it is crucial in us understanding aspects of this chapter where we are, Genesis 49. And the fact that we are at the end of this foundational, monumental book, the book of Genesis, the first book in the Bible. We're coming to the very end of it. And any book, in that sense, you know, if you read a book, the beginning, you know, introduces and it's key, and then the end is key. And obviously the stuff in the middle is important as well. It's not like you can throw that away. But there's a certain importance in the beginning and the end in understanding and if you understand the beginning and the end you also understand better the in-between so the last things that are said in a book of any kind often are very important and the book of Genesis is not uh, any different in that regard in fact it is crucial what is said here and at the same time, some of this might be for many of us like, I don't really get it. What's going on here? But I think, I, hopeful, I ho hope that after today's sermon also, you'll see that, wow, there's, there's a lot there that you might not have noticed first. But what are the things I want to remind you first before we are in Genesis 49? A few passages, uh, four different passages in the book of Genesis. First, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, I've referred to this many times, but it's crucial again in understanding specifically the blessing that Jacob gives to his son Judah and the future implications of that and how it relates to Jesus. In Genesis chapter 1, we've seen God create the heavens and the earth and everything that is in, in there, and he creates mankind in his image, Adam out of the soil, to have dominion over this kingdom, this creation that he has created. And in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, it says this, And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And then it continues. Right from the beginning, what it means to be human and what God's purpose for humanity is as his image bearers, there's this aspect of fruitfulness, but also to rule, fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion, aspect of ruling over something, to have dominion, that's why it's called the dominion mandate. This is a crucial component of what it means to be human and God's design for the earth and humanity. Okay, just a reminder, keep that in behind your ear, so to say, especially as we'll see God's promise to Judah later on. Then we see that mankind miserably fail. Adam and Eve, the first man and woman, they rebel against their king. They fail in righteous dominion over the creation. In fact, they rebel against the king who gave them this command. And they sin. And the whole human race, uh, as descendants of Adam and Eve, sin in Adam. And we continue to sin to this very day. But as Adam and Eve have sinned, God gives his response to their sin. He gives this promise that I've again referred to many times, but it's so important. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, as God speaks 
to Adam and then Eve. And he also speaks to the serpent, Satan, in the form of a serpent. And also remember that as we get later in Genesis 49. Serpent, bad <laughs> reminder of the fall into sin, serpent. Uh, because that, that will be important in Jacob's blessing to uh, his sons. But as God says that, uh, he says, gives this promise, Genesis 3 verse 15, I will put enmity between you and the woman, he's talking to the serpent, and between your offspring, literally your seed, and her seed, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heed, heel. So there's, from the beginning, those who follow Satan, the serpent, and those who follow uh, God, there's enmity between them. But ultimately, there's this promise that he, the seed of the woman, he shall bruise the head of the serpent. And the serpent shall bruise his heel. This is what is often called the first promise uh, of the gospel, the proto-evangelion, the, the, the first kind of thing that there will be a savior, there will be a victorious, wounded warrior, so to say. He will be victorious because he will crush the head of the serpent, but also he will be bruised on the heel. He will be wounded, yet he will be victorious. This is the first promise, kind of a bit cryptic, and uh, this we know uh, in light of the rest of Scripture is ultimately the Lord Jesus Christ. But okay, in the book of Genesis, this is what we've seen. We know the promise, and ever since this point, Adam and Eve and their descendants have been waiting. When, the, when is the seed of the woman coming? I believe Eve even thought that Abel was that seed of the woman, Yahweh himself had come. Well, then when I preached back uh, in Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, I expressed my views on that and even how the translations are not always very helpful with that. But anyway, there's been a waiting of the seed of the woman. There will be a savior, a wounded, victorious seed of the woman will come. Then Genesis chapter 9, verse... Uh, Genesis 9, God makes a covenant with Noah. Noah is like a second Adam in that sense. All of humanity and everything else is destroyed except Noah and his family on the ark and the animals with him. And God makes a covenant with Noah and with all creation. And this covenant of Noah is still in a applies even still today and on this basis we can eat meat and on this basis there should be capital punishment and these kind of things uh, but regarding here then we see uh, in as God has made this covenant with Noah in Genesis chapter 9 verse 16 let's see no 26 uh -huh. I need to learn to read my own handwriting. Verse 26 in Genesis 9. It says, Noah here, uh, this is actually what I'll be preaching in the Finnish service later today, but regarding my point here is that Noah pronounces this curse on Cain and the son of Ham because of the sin of Ham. But then in verse 26, he pronounces a blessing. He says, he also said, blessed be Yahweh, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem and let Canaan be his servant. And now, so now we see from here and then the following chapters, we see the seed of the woman. Okay, that's all of mankind's descendants are seed of the woman, but we know one of them is going to be unique. Now we've seen that it has to be from the family of Noah. Well, there is no other family at this point anyway. But now we know it's not just any descendant of Noah. We know that it will be from, not from Ham's tribe, not from Japheth's tribe. It will be from Shem's tribe. He will be a Shemite because blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servants. And, and then we see the genealogies here. The rest of the book of Genesis starts focusing on the descendants of Shem. And that's where we get even the word Semitic, anti-Semitism, like uh, Jewish people are Semites. They're descendants of Shem. So we know, okay, the promised line has been narrowed to Shem. In chapter 12, 
we see God calling this man Abram, who is a descendant of Shem. And God gives this promise to Abram. Later he changes his name to Abraham. And he even clarifies this covenant even more. But God gives this blessing that in Abram, so Genesis chapter 12, as he's calling Abram out to serve him, he says, verse 3, I will bless those who bless you, and, in, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you, so in Abram, Abram the Shemite, in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So now we know seed of the woman, okay, he will be wounded victorious. We know that it is a descendant of Noah, not just descendant of Noah, but specifically Shem. And now from Shem we know that it is in Abram. In Abram, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And these are all still like, obviously there's no mention of the word Jesus or things. These are kind of cryptic, but this is God is giving us breadcrumbs to uh, kind of give us the anticipation and, and uh, looking forward to the final promised Messiah. So we know, okay, yes, these things, and now somehow through Abram, not only to Abraham and the Shemites, but through this specific, specific Shemite Abraham, all the families of the earth, so all other nations, all, including still today in Finland or China or the UK or wherever, Turkey, India, uh, anywhere, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And then it's a little bit like, okay, there's a certain amount of blessing that even Abraham himself and there's other nations that kind of share in that and Abraham has to fight and do different things and so forth. And there's certain people who then uh, are blessed as we've seen uh, even Pharaoh as he blesses Abraham's descendants, even though he's a pagan king, he's even blessed actually like financially even. Uh, so there's certain kind of that, but there's still this ultimate fulfillment that all the families of the earth will be blessed in Abraham in some way. Then we see that the promise of this Abrahamic uh, covenant, the promise, it goes from Abraham, not to all of Abraham's sons, but specifically to Isaac. And then we know that from Isaac it passes down, not to all of Isaac's sons, but specifically to Jacob. This is what we've been spending many weeks and months kind of going through this history. And now we are at the end of the book of Genesis. We are at the very last moment, last evening, last hours of this man Jacob's life. And we come to the end of this book. And as we think about all of that and what the book of Genesis has been, one of the questions that should be in our mind that we should have some kind of uh, answer to before we're done with the book of Genesis is, how does the promise continue? How will God's promise continue? Who, when, how will the seed of the woman, the wounded victor come? How will the Abrahamic blessing and promise be ultimately, like how are the nations of the earth, all of the families of the earth going to be blessed in Abraham? How? Now Abraham has his, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Jacob is the patriarch whose name is changed into Israel. Jacob is Israel. And now he has 12 sons, 12 tribes. Which direction is it going to go now? From Noah, we saw Shem. It went to the promise. Obviously, the other ones are important too. The thing is, but there can only be one line that holds the messianic promise because it will be one individual who comes eventually, who is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the big question that should be on our minds as we think in a biblical kind of view, who, how will this promised seed of the woman come? And that's one of the key things that this blessing that Jacob gives to his son will tell us. It will be Judah. It will be Judah. Uh, and then it tells us many other things as well. But that is key in understanding the flow of God's promise. Let me read to you Genesis 49. And then we'll walk through and look at some of the important aspects of this. <coughs> so the people of Israel 
are in Egypt. Uh, we've seen that they've, you know, the Pharaoh has blessed them and helped them in many ways. And now they've been living there. And now Jacob is an old, old man and he's just ready to die. And before that, he gives this prophetic, poetic proclamation to his sons. Genesis 49 verse 1, Then Jacob called his sons and said, Gather yourselves together, that I may tell you what shall happen to you in the days to come. Assemble and listen, O sons of Jacob. Listen to Israel, your father. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, and the first fruits of my strength, preeminent in dignity and preeminent in power, unstable as water. You shall not have preeminence because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. Simeon and Levi are brothers. Weapons of violence are their swords. Let my soul not come into their counsel. O oh, my glory, be not joined to their company. For in their anger they killed men, and in their willfulness they hamstrung oxen. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Judah, your brothers shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down, he crouched as a lion and as a lioness. Who dares rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him. And to him shall be the obedience of the peoples binding his foal to the vine and his donkeys called to the choice vine. He has washed his garments in wine and his vesture in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine and his teeth whiter than milk. Zebulun shall dwell at the shore of the sea. He shall become a haven for ships and his border shall be at Sidon. Issachar is a strong donkey crouching between the sheepfolds. He saw that a resting place was good and that the land was pleasant. So he bowed his shoulder to bear and became a servant at forced labor. Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent in the way, a viper by the path that bites the horse's heels so that his rider falls backward. I wait for your salvation, O Yahweh. Raiders shall raid Gad, but he shall raid at their heels. Asher, food, Asher's Food shall be rich, and he shall yield royal delicacies. Naphtali is a doe let loose that bears beautiful fawns. Joseph is a fruitful bow, a fruitful bow by a spring. His branches run over the wall. The archers bitterly attacked him, shot at him, and harassed him severely. Yet his bow remained unmoved. His arms were made agile by the hands of the mighty one of Jacob. From there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. By the God of your Father, who will help you, by the Almighty, who will bless you with the blessings of heaven above, 
blessings of the deep that crouches beneath, blessings of the breasts and of the womb, the blessings of your father are mighty beyond the blessings of my parents, up to the bounties of the everlasting hills. May they be on the head of Joseph and on the brow of him who, has set up, who, who was set apart from his brothers. Benjamin is a ravenous wolf, in the morning devouring the prey and at evening dividing the spoil. All these are the twelve tribes of Israel. This is what their father said to them as he blessed them, blessing each with the blessing suitable to him. Then he commanded them and said to them, I am to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephraim the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field at Machpelah, to the east of Mamre, in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with the field from Ephraim the Hittite to possess as a burial place. There they buried Abraham and Sarah his wife. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah his wife. And there I buried Leah. The field and the cave that is, that is in it were brought, bought from the Hittites. When Jacob finished commanding his sons, he drew up his feet into the bed and breathed his last and was gathered to his people. That's Genesis 49. The last moments, last hours, last day of Jacob. This great man of God with all his failures as we've seen plenty. But still a man that God used greatly in his purpose and plan. What should we understand from this? It's a little bit like cryptic even. And I think, you know, there, there's, you'll be like, what, what is this talking about? What are all these animals and different things? And I don't really get it. Um, as even a lot of Bible commentators arguing about different things. There's even some parts of this that are even very difficult to even translate. There's different, like, is this relating to an animal or something else? But the big thing here is that Jacob is pronouncing this prophetic also poetic proclamation to his sons. He is blessing them. He's blessing them all. Notice he blessed them all, blessing each. He's not just blessing Joseph and Judah, for example. He's blessing them all, even though it might seem, especially as you think, read about Reuben, it's like, is that a blessing at all? Or Simeon and Levi, it's more of a curse in some degrees. And yes, it is to some degrees, but... It is a blessing at the very least in the point of the basic definition of a blessing right from the beginning when God blesses animals and when God blesses mankind at the very core of what a blessing is, is to multiply, to become more, to become greater. And the fact that all of these tribes will not end with the person themselves, but will continue. They will become tribes, and some of them mightier than others, but they will become uh, great uh, channels that God is going to be used in different ways. That itself is a great blessing. They will multiply. They will become not just 12 sons of Jacob with their immediate families. They will eventually become the 12 tribes and very significant in the purpose and plan of God, even I believe even in the future, as they are uh, mentioned in the book of Revelation, 12 tribes of Israel. But Jacob, he calls his sons, he's gathered them together. Again, he's a very old man, he's just about to die, just with his last breath, so to say, almost like sitting up on his bed, as we saw there later, as he's done, he puts his feet up and breathes his last. So as he's there, you can imagine these 12 sons around him, around the bed, and he now speaks to them. And the first thing he speaks to Reuben, and to Reuben again, it is, it begins good, and Reuben was maybe even hoping like, okay, yes, I'm the firstborn, which is significant. 
First form, my might, the first fruits of my strength, preeminent in dignity and preeminent in power. I was like, this is sounded really good. Yes, yes. Good. And then unstable as water. And then Reuben. Mm, yeah. And Reuben knows exactly. And none of them argue against him. Why is, what is this referring to? It's referring to Genesis 35, verse 22. Uh, it's referring to Reuben's sin uh, uh, regarding... Uh, uh, well, let me just read it to you briefly. Genesis 35, it's just one verse. While Israel lived in that land, Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard of it. And it very likely, as some of you might remember when we looked at that passage, it likely could have even be that this was an um, attempt of him to almost like usurp his father's authority in some way to take his father's concubine and things like that. Either way, he's now, he's lost the rights of the firstborn because of his sin and he's described as unstable as water. You could almost translate as boiling as water, but the idea is he's destructive as water. Water can destroy and he has destroyed his own inheritance in this sense. And even though He's, many of these great things, all of that, he will not have the preeminence, he has lost it. He has lost it. He will still be used by God greatly, he's still one of the tribes of Israel, but he will not gain any special blessing as the firstborn son. He's unstable as water. And that is seen in his sin there in Genesis 35. Then he continues on to Simeon and Levi. And uh, by the way, he's not going through them. It is very likely that the order he's going through is that the sons just kind of happen to be in this order. This is not the exact order of age. Although there's certain, you know, Benjamin is the youngest and Reuben is the firstborn. But they were roughly there in this order. Simeon and Levi, this is the only one that he puts them together and gives them, you know, they were apparently very close to each other, Simeon and Levi. And he calls them... They're brothers, just like the others are brothers, but they were close to one another. And he says that their weapons of violence are their swords. And then he says, let my soul not come into their counsel, O my glory, be not joined to their company, for their anger, for in their anger they killed men, and in their willfulness they hamstrung ox and cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Simeon and Levi are characterized with violence and cruelty. And we have seen a very vivid example of this. I'm sure there were other aspects and their father would have known the character of his sons, Simeon and Levi. But in chapter 34, you might remember there's the uh, issue where... Dinah, their sister, is uh, defiled and mistreated very badly. So there's an evil thing that had been done, but then Simeon and Levi take this as justification. And to some degree, again, even then we saw that Jacob didn't really seem to do anything about it, so at least they did something about it. But... They were still motivated by cruelty and fierce anger. There was the sinful overflowing of cruelty and anger, and they killed and massacred the whole city, the Shechemites. They did that, which itself caused a danger even to the descendants of Jacob, and suddenly they might have like full-out war going on. That is one example we've seen, and that's what he, he refers to. In their anger, they killed men. But he also says, in their willfulness, they hamstrung oxen. What is he referring to here? We don't know exactly uh, what this occasion was. But, and actually, some translations even had to translate this differently. Some translations understand this as they dig down a wall, which is very different from uh, hamstrung an oxen. Uh, hamstrung in an oxen, an animal, means to cripple an animal. Basically, to cut certain parts of their legs so that the oxen cannot certainly not be used as an ox to carry weight anymore and even to cripple. And the 
if that is the case here, which I believe that seems to be in most translations translated that way, but even if it was dig down a wall, it seems to be that they just made the wall crumble for no reason. They had just this desire for violence and cruelty, and it was seen in their actions, whether it was massacring, like just going way overboard, uh, massacring a whole city, or then even in cruelty, hamstrunging the oxen of the other people and just doing things that were just way over the top and cruel and unjust. And because of these things, then Simeon and Levi will be scattered in Israel. It's like too much to have them kind of condensed. They will be scattered in one way or another. God will use them greatly. In fact, the Levites become the priestly tribe which is very significant, but also that the Levites then, because of their the priestly type, they don't have an inheritance of their own. In fact, they have cities that are scattered throughout Israel to kind of keep them in control. And as priests, maybe that's also God's wisdom. These Levites, descendants of Levi, seem to have a lot of, again, like a, aggression to some degree. And one of the things that God used for good also in the Levites is, we see in the book of Numbers... We might think a priest, you know, first of all, we have an idea of some Roman Catholic priest or, or what, whatever, and just kind of some old man, you know, shaking some bells or incense or like an Orthodox church or whatever. But when we think about the Levites, there's an aspect that they were warriors. They were warriors. There's not some old frail man walking around a church building all the time. We could think of them more accurately as these sacred warriors. First of all, they slaughtered a lot of animals, which is part of it. And you have to be strong enough and you have to have some guts in your... Like, just not anyone can do that than just even physically laborious tasks. But not only that, they had the, by God, appointed the responsibility, which is given to us in the book of Numbers, chapter 1, Verse 51, let me read to you. Uh, anyway, we'll talk first about the Levites there, but in verse 51 it says, When the tabernacle is set out, the Levites shall take it down. And when the tabernacle is to be pitched, the Levites shall set it up. So they will set up and put up the tabernacles. A lot of physical labor in that sense. And... If any outsider comes near, he shall be put to death. God gives the Levites, the tribe of Levi, the sanction that if there's someone who tries to uh, profane and to misuse the, 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 the serious and the holiness of the temple and so forth, they literally could kill people on the go. They weren't just like calling some police. They were the police of the city. They were the executioners also. <laughs> So I'm just mentioning this also that even that God is using even their, so their, the cruelty went overboard. It was evil and sinful and that's where they judged and that's where they scattered. But in this sense, this was not gender cruelty. This was then uh, violence uh, sanctioned by God himself for a holy purpose. And those who would seek to uh, do against what God commanded were at times then executed by the Levites. And an example in the book of Exodus is a very significant one, which is one example where the tribe of Levi, through the act of violence, actually redeemed themselves to a certain degree, that something that brings glory to God. Exodus chapter 35, or no, Exodus 32, Exodus chapter 32, there's the whole golden calf incident. And then verse 25 in Exodus 32 says, And when Moses saw that the people had broken loose, for Aaron had let them break loose to the derision of their enemies, then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Who is on Yahweh's side? Come to me. So all the tribes of Israel and all that, and there's this golden calf incident and all that. And it says, and all the sons of Levi gathered round him. They came to Moses, and Moses said to them, Thus says Yahweh, God of Israel, put your sword on your side, each of you, and go to and fro from the gate throughout the camp, 
and each of you kill his brother and his companion and his neighbor. And the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses. And that day about 3,000 men of the people fell. And Moses said, today you have been ordained for the service of Yahweh, each one at the cost of his son or his brother, so that he might bestow a blessing upon you this day. The next day Moses said to the people, you have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up to Yahweh. Perhaps I can make atonement for you. We might read, this is some of those things like G-rate, whatever, PG-13, 18, whatever, like, it's like, whoa, what's going on there? Because we have such a low view of the holiness of God and the seriousness of sin. But here, the Levites, the descendants of Levi, even the tribe that was scattered, God has blessed them. So even though we might see here, it's just a, they multiplied and later on, even it was a good thing. It was a God-honoring thing that they came and did this great even act of violence. Because these people had committed a great sin against God. So, Levi and Simeon are both used greatly by God, uh, but still as a tribe, they're scattered uh, abroad because of their uh, unjust anger. And if you think about this again, if you were in one of these tribes, if you were descendant, first of all, Simeon, Levi and their descendants, imagine how many times they, they would have had memorized these things and they would think so many times like what did Israel like Jacob what, what did he say about us our, fa our wrath is cruel you know basically our weakness and then they would have tried to okay this is our weakness this is our strength and we need to try and get it under control and they should have tried to live so it was also kind of not only telling what will happen in the future as he said, what will happen in the days to come, but it was also teaching them an aspect of how they are to, what they are to guard against, what their weaknesses, what their sinful tendencies are. Then we come to Judah. Judah. And this is key of all the sons of Jacob. First of all, before we read this, it's not that Judah is a, just a, a, a man without any sin. In fact, there is a whole chapter devoted to Judah's sin, sexual sin, earlier in the book of Genesis, and we looked at that. So what is different then about, for example, Reuben, who is his sexual sin, and then Judah's sexual sin? I think one of the things that has to be a big difference here, first of all, I think we've already seen that Judah has kind of stepped up as a leader amongst his brother to help uh, Joseph and so forth. I think we've seen already much repentance in his heart. And then when Judah himself was convicted earlier there, when he did the uh, sin, he then... In his uh, words, we saw uh, attitudes of that she is more righteous than I am. There was a repentance already then, and I think further and further on. Judah has repented. He's a changed man. God has been working in him. And perhaps also true, humiliating him in this way and to bring in repentance, he has now, as an individual Judah and then Judah's descendants, have been brought into a position of leadership that they can do that even more faithfully than he would have going through some of those difficulties in the time of repentance. He's been stripped of pride and arrogance and things like that, just like Joseph has been stripped of uh, his youthful pride. Judah is said that your brother shall praise you. Judah actually means basically praise. So there's a word play. Your brother shall praise you and your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. And your father, shall, son, shall bow down before you. Isn't this interesting? Because who, who has been talked about being bowed down uh, here earlier? It's been Joseph. In Joseph's dreams and every, his brothers will bow down before Joseph. But now it's Judah. So at this point, it seems no one is bowing down before Judah, really. But it is looking toward the future. It's a prophetic proclamation. He's, he shall rule over his enemies... And his father's sons, so not only the enemies brought, will be under him, but 
he, the other tribes of Israel shall bow down before him. And then Judah is described as a lion, a lion's cub. Uh, and uh, he says, Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down and crouched as a lion, and as a lioness, who dares rouse him? So it's like a young lion who's strong and gets his prey, and then even less described as an older lion who now sits down and no one is willing to mess with him. A lion. And this is where we get the term lion of Judah. Lion of Judah. You might have heard it in even some Christian songs and things. And you will definitely have seen it if you read the book of Revelation. The lion from the tribe of Judah. Which we'll just look at in just a moment. So Judah is described as a lion. And then it's told to us in verse 10, the scepter... So he's like the, 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 the stick of uh, authority as a king. The king's scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. So Judah is a lion, and he is gonna, he's, the, he's the king. So Judah's tribe will be the tribe of future rulers, kings. He will have the scepter of authority. He will have the ruler's staff. And it will not uh, depart from between his feet. I believe it's referencing to between his feet is even like sexual organs. His seed, his seed line, his descendants will have the stick of uh, the ruler's stick and the scepter. The ruler, the kings will come from Judah. And ultimately, the king of kings will come from Judah. Notice that. So it's talking about Judah and Judah's descendants. But then it has this weird saying, until tribute comes to him. So in verse 10, middle of verse 10, until tribute comes to him is what the ESV says. If you have some other translation, I don't remember now all the different English translations, how they translate, but also many... Uh, translate English translations translate it until so instead of until tribute comes to him or some say until until he comes to whom it belongs or something like that and then some translate until Shiloh comes kind of almost like a name a Shiloh until Shiloh comes but this is reference to something happening there's different views about this and again different ideas of how exactly to translate this without getting too much into the details. I believe uh, and trusting you know, much more learned men than I who have studied this out, it seems to be that the best translation is until Shiloh comes. So more as a title, a kind of a name uh, to a certain individual. And this is also how it is being understood in early church history. Actually, even the Jewish people have understood this as a reference to the Messiah. Basically, that until the Messiah comes, until the one who comes in the line of Judah to whom it belongs, the scepter will not pass. Kingly rule will be in the line of Judah, and it will not pass away and given to any other tribe. And there will be a time when the one who comes to whom it belongs. And I believe this is referencing the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Lion of Judah. And notice, it says, And to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. The peoples, the people of the earth who are going to be blessed in Abraham, will come in obedience to him. This one who will come from the line of Judah, who seems to be referenced to Shiloh. Shiloh very likely also is, uh, again, there's debate about it, but it, it very likely is kind of a derivative of the word shalom, so peace, the one, basically the prince of peace, the one who brings peace, the Messiah. Until Shiloh comes and the obedience of the people shall be to him. Well, I mentioned in the book of Revelation, we're given... In Revelation chapter 5, verse 5, we are given this vision of the Lamb. 
who is the lamb and you know, God obviously sacrificed an animal, very likely a lamb, to cover the shame of Adam and Eve. He gave them uh, leather clothing. And then at lambs have been sacrificed unto God. Jesus is the Lamb of God. But not only that, verse 5, in Gen Revelation 5, verse 5, it says, One of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered, so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And then in verse 9, a few verses on there, well, it talks about first the lamb there, the lamb who's slain, but he's the lion, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 9, And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. This is the final fulfillment. This is future still even. Final ful fulfillment of the seed of the woman, the one the de descendant of Shem, the one descendant of Abraham, in whom all the families of the earth, every tribe, language, people, and nation, all those who come to him in obedience and faith, to the one who is the lion from the tribe of Judah, from the root of David. David is a descendant of Judah. David, great King David. And that's why David is a king. And that's why earlier when we read our scripture reading, it talks about Hosanna to the king, uh, son of David. Because they knew where the Messiah was going to come, the promised one. He couldn't just come from anywhere because he had to be seed of the woman, Descendant of Shem, descendant of Abraham, descendant of Judah, descendant of David, and so forth. And that's all that Jesus was. And then, think about then the, the other part of this promise that God gives to Judah. Verse 11 in Genesis 49. What's this talk about the vine and then washing your clothes in wine? And blood of grapes, and his eyes are darker than wine, and his teeth whiter than milk. Well, first of all, it's an image of abundance. Because what is said here, so he will come, this Shiloh, this character, this Messiah, who we know is the Lord Jesus Christ. The image, this poetic image here is that when he comes, he will put his animal, you know, so he comes with his animals or whatever. So instead of on a metal hook on a stone or whatever else or around a tree, he will put it on the vine, so where the grapes grow. Normally you don't do that. You know why? Because it's kind of valuable. You don't put an animal that might then start pulling it and suddenly it's like, where's all my grapes? It's gone. You certainly don't put it on the, the, the choice uh, like so the best of the best you keep the animals away first of all so that they would eat it but then they would pull it the idea is here that in the Messiah's kingdom abundance will be so great that it's like yeah you could use that this, another maybe modern example would be to light your barbecue with like no 500 euro notes or something like that you know it's like oh yeah i just have way too much of these and so it doesn't matter if it's the newspaper or the money you know just so much of it the idea that there will be an abundance in Shiloh's kingdom of uh, growing, uh, growing vines and there will be of uh, milk, uh, abundance of these uh, blessings uh, of God. What is the first miracle that Jesus did? What is the first miracle that Jesus did? This, this used to, uh, <laughs> yeah, just think, good, good if you have it in your thoughts. He turned water into wine, a lot of wine. This used to disturb me. I was like, not like, oh, you know, anyway. Uh, <laughs> but nowadays I was like, oh, I get it, and I understand. First of all, wine is a gift from God when used rightly, when used wrongly, it brings judgment and foolishness, just like even food is a gift from God and used wrongly, it's gluttony and sin and so forth. But why did Jesus start his ministry's first public miracle? He goes to a wedding where people are already drank a lot of wine, and there's a lot of wine, and then he's like, yeah, I'll turn, you know, hundreds of liters of water into wine. And then they're like, what? What did you do? Part of this was glimpses of Shiloh has come. 
the descendant of Judah, whose kingdom will be characterized by an abundance of wine and milk and everything else, the gifts of God rightly used. He begins his ministry with attending this wedding and doing this great miracle. Jesus' first miracle, creating an abundance of wine from uh, water. And this finds its future fulfillment uh, in the coming kingdom. So we talk about Jesus came the first time as the lamb to sacrifice his life for his people. And the second time he will come, he will come as the Lion of Judah. Always he is the Lion of Judah, but it's emphasizing next time he comes, he comes to judge. Next time he comes to, he comes to set up his kingdom. And he will rule in righteousness. And to him shall be the obedience of the people. That he will rule with the ruler's staff. He will have the scepter. And he is the lion of Judah. Judah therefore becomes the lion through which the Messiah will come. But not only that, Judah becomes the ruling tribe of Israel. Again, David was from Judah and so forth. He, because he's the kingly tribe. So the messianic tribe and the kingly tribe. And that's why, if you ever kind of wondered also, you, Israel is often referred to as Judea. Why is it Judea? Because Judah as a tribe becomes so significant eventually that to be an Israelite is in some ways to be a Judean. And that's where we get the word Jew. Jew is essentially a shorthand for a Judean, a Judahite. Even though not all Jews are descendants of Judah, but because Judah became the leading prominent tribe, it's synonymous, and that's how Paul even uses it in the New Testament. He uses it as synonymous, Jew, Hebrew, Israelite, it's the same thing, and Jew means it has its etymology in a Judean, a Jew, Judahite. Okay, well, I'll skip briefly these other ones now here. Zebulun, uh, we don't, uh, Zebulun, Issachar, and Don, Asher, and Naphtali, we don't know too much about the details of how these things were actually played out in uh, future uh, kind of history. And some of this is, again, even some disagreement about some translations. But there's main principles. First of all, Zebulun, it says, Zebulun shall, shall dwell at the shore of the sea. He shall become a haven for ships and his border shall be at Sidon. The so Zebulun's tribe will be characterized by what you could briefly uh, refer to as merchants. They will be heavily involved in merchants and dwelling near the sea and, and so forth. That is part of how they will be used as a tribe and, and their kind of focus. Issachar then is mentioned, Issachar is a strong donkey crouching between the sheepfolds. He saw that the resting place was good and that the land was pleasant, so he bowed his shoulder to bear and became a servant at forced labor. There's disagreement about this. Is this a positive thing that's said about Issachar or a negative thing? I think it's more of a negative thing. First of all, yes, he's a strong donkey, kind of, so it's, a, it's not a, we might call a donkey like an insult. It's not an insult. It's a donkey is a very good animal, helpful. He's a strong, he has strength. The problem with Issachar seems to be that he saw a resting place that was good and land that was pleasant. He saw an easy, comfortable life and was willing to be a servant at forced labels, he was willing to become a slave in order to live an easy, comfortable life. Even though he had strength and he could have done something greater, he was willing to give away that for ease and comfort. And how often we think the same. We give, uh, we, we, we do not do even things that we could do and be a help and a blessing to others. But because we see it's an easy and good, pleasant land, he was willing to become a slave. Uh, in order to live that. Give away his freedom for a life of ease and comfort. That seems to be what this Akar's uh, tribe is then characterized as. Some people think it was a good thing and he's just willing to be a servant and help others. I think there, and most commentators agree, it seems to be a negative aspect of what is emphasized in Issachar. Don is a very 
small and insignificant tribe in many ways, but Dan is said, Dan shall, be, shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent in the way, a viper by the path that bites the horse's heels that the rider falls backward. Okay? So even the Dan would be an insignificant tribe in many ways. And he's very small on his own. He shall be used by God and he will be a judge. He shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. He'll be on the same level and in some ways will be used greatly by God. So even though he's small as a serpent, he can have a lot of impact. Issachar was a strong donkey and seemed to have little impact because he lived a life of ease instead of doing hardship. Dan is just a serpent, but the serpent, even though it's small, can make a big horse fall backward and kill a big animal. So it was a good thing. Dan will be used, a small insignificant tribe, but used greatly by God because of his strength, even though he's small. But the interesting thing, why is verse 18 there? Why is verse 18 there? If you look in your Bibles. Why? Does Jacob suddenly say something weird in between? Why does he say it after he said to Dan? <coughs> I read these different commentators and a lot of these liberal commentators who don't believe that Moses wrote all the book of Moses anyway and whatever, they just believe it's peace thing and it doesn't make sense and different things. A lot of them believe that this is not part of the original because it doesn't make sense. Like it's just like this well, they had these different traditions and some scribe wrote this there and it doesn't make, like, it doesn't make any sense. And I have to say also, I was also, obviously I don't believe that, but I was like, why does he say that there? It seems a little bit out of place. But is it? I don't think it actually is out of place. And I believe one of the reasons there, first of all, what Jacob there says, I wait for your salvation, O Yahweh. He could say that at any place, and in some ways it would be appropriate, it's true. But why does he say it specifically after Dan? I believe the reason very likely is that, first of all, he's been talking about Judah already, and he knows, that, understands that the kingly rule and the future seed of the woman will come from Judah's tribe. So he's already thinking, and now he's talked about these other tribes a little bit. And now he's talking about this little Dan tribe, and he talks about how Dan is a serpent in the way. And so here, Dan is being a serpent is a good thing, but also serpent can be a bad thing. And even in Dan's history, sometimes it will be a bad thing that he's acting like as a serpent. He, sometimes through the tribes of Dan, there was false worship introduced into the people of Israel. But as he thinks about the serpent and Dan, I believe he kind of like his memory, he's thinking about that original serpent, Satan. And he's thinking about, yes, there will be a victorious Savior who will one day come. A Savior will come. And that's why he just stops and says, I wait for your salvation, O Yahweh. First time ever in the Bible that the word salvation is used. Interesting thing. The word salvation is essentially the same as Jesus. Uh, Yahshua. Shua, salvation. Yahshua, salvation is from God. I believe that's why he briefly just stops and he thinks. He looks forward and he waits for the salvation that it will come eventually. Uh, since I've gone so far here, I will... Uh, I have so much material here, so I'll, I'll, I'll just wrap it up and, and we will then continue with the rest of the, the blessings. Uh, Gad and Asher and Naphtali and Joseph and Benjamin in a future sermon. But to summarize what we've looked today and the significance of this is that this blessing that God gives uh, through Jacob, that Jacob speaks to his sons, is key in us in that sense understanding as we come to the end of Genesis and the death of Jacob and these tribes we now know that the line will continue from Judah. We now know that. We know also that these other tribes will be significant in their own way, but we know that the ruler 
the King of Kings, the ultimate Lion of Judah, the one through whom the obedience of the peoples will be, the one through whom will be these God's promises fulfilled. He is the seed of the woman who will crush the head of the serpent and at the same time will be uh, bitten in the heel. He is the one who is Abraham's descendant in, all, in whom all the families of the earth will find their blessing. He is the one who with his own life will ransom men and women from every nation, tribe and language to be the people of God. And that is essentially in a nutshell then what the rest of the whole Bible is. The Old Testament is following the line of Judah and the different things that happen, a lot of human sin and a lot of different things and so forth, but the kind of the, the red cord that goes through the Bible, that promised, promised line, and that's why the New Testament begins with the genealogy of Jesus to show that Jesus is the one. He is the descendant of Judah, the descendant of David. He is the son of David. He is the promised one. He is Shiloh, to whom belongs the scepter. And one day he will come again, and eventually we'll see all of this in its final fulfillment as he establishes his kingdom and rules over his enemies. Now let us pray. Our Father, we thank you that the Lord Jesus Christ has come. We thank you that you promised his coming right in the beginning. Now we know the fullness of your plan who He is, what He has done, and all of that. But right from the beginning, there was the promise of a Redeemer. And we've seen it develop in the book of Genesis, as you've been telling us more and more and more. And Lord, help us to rejoice and trust in Him. And may you use us as instruments to be a blessing to others in being a vehicle through which you will bring the message of Christ to others, that others might from the families of the earth, the tribes of the earth, that there might be more who we see in our church and in our interaction with other people, that there might be more people whom you have ransomed, who will come and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Savior of sinners. So we thank you, Lord, and may you use this. May you help us to live in light of these truths ourselves, in greater love toward you and love toward one another. These things we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.